So one thing that you've done that I, I really appreciate because it comes completely with the spirit of how I've done this show is you've really tried to build bridges with people that perhaps some might think you shouldn't get along with or you shouldn't talk with. So I've seen you a couple times with uh, Glenn Beck and, yep. and I was tweeting up a storm the first time I saw it because I thought this is exactly what the news is supposed to be. This is what, not, not reporting, but this is what conversation is supposed to be. You guys come from very different places. You know, he's a, a pure libertarian, I suppose. Uh, your politics are different. And, you know, you're just trying to have the conversation. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And I thought it was pretty beautiful. I, I, so I guess I don't even know what my question is as much as I want to see more of that. Well, he, but you say that our politics are different. I'm not political. I'm like the least political person that you. Come I don't, on, come I swear, on. I swear, I don't care about conservative or liberal. I think all politicians are full of it. I, I think I, I'll lot, go with you on that. And I judge things on my own. So you know, and especially coming from an African American background, African Americans are pretty liberal in some things, and also very conservative, and many times conservative socially when it comes to the church. Yeah. So, you know, you know, for people to sit there and pretend like, oh, we're these big liberals, and they're not, and then you don't accept gay people. And then, it, so, it's it's not true. So I'm not, I, I am not political. So when you say my politics are different, it's not. I will listen, I think the only way, especially if it's someone you don't agree with, or if you consider them your enemy or not on your side, don't you wanna know what they're thinking? I don't understand when people say, I am never going to talk to them. How could you, how would you dare sit down? You know how much crap I got because I, uh, like, I, because I sat down twice yeah. with Darren Wilson. And I went, um, I almost got the interview. It was between me, uh, George Stephanopoulos, and one other person. I forget who it was. And we, we almost, you know, George ended up getting the interview. I got so much guff because I wanted to do an interview with him. It's like, well, don't you want to hear from him? Like, even if you don't agree with him, especially if you don't agree with him, you want to hear his rationale and his reasoning. So it, it has never made sense to me to um, not talk to someone who you disagree with. Now, that said, I think that people should be respectful and they should be in their right minds, you know, before you or when you're talking to them. And if they don't, then they're out of here. I'll, I'll cut you right off. If yeah. You're, I, yeah, if you're being an ignoramus, I'm not dealing with it. Yeah, well, interestingly, I, I wasn't even going to bring this up, but a couple months ago, maybe two months ago or so, you had uh, Sam Harris, who's been on my show, who's uh, become yeah. a friend of mine, and, and Dino Bedala were on, and they were, they were debating this Islam and, and sort of you know, religion versus people thing. And in the midst of it, Dean said something that I knew to be, uh, you know, implying that Sam believed something about all Muslims, and I knew it to be not true because I had sat there with Sam and rehashed it. He's rehashed it a thousand times. And while it was infuriating for me to watch, I thought, all right, at least they're having the conversation. So that's what you're just opening the door for. Yeah. And the, the thing about that is, is, is that we have to stop um, calling people, you know, isms or obias, phobias, not homophobic or Islamophobic or whatever, because they want to have a conversation. That's part, that's what we do, Yeah, is have a conversation. And when you have great minds like, you know, a Fareed Zakaria or Sam Harris or wh whomever who say, yes, there is a problem that must be addressed in Islam and we have to figure out how to do it. When you have great minds like that, those are the people that you should listen to. When you have people who say, there is no problem. And by you saying this, then you are Islamophobic. Then that person is very dangerous because the evidence is there. It doesn't mean that people in that religion are bad. It doesn't mean that, it, that Islam is bad. It doesn't mean, mean that Muslims are bad. It doesn't mean that because we talk about crime in Chicago that is committed mostly by African-Americans. It doesn't mean that African-Americans are bad or that black people are bad. It means that we, we're just having those conversations. And so um, we have to stop that. And, and you know, that's, I think that's why I can talk to someone like a Glenn Beck is because you know, I, wanna, I would rather have common ground with people or try to reach some sort of common ground or consensus rather than just having them an enemy, keeping them at arm's length and not being at the table. That's what's happening in Washington and, and with the Congress right now. What good is that doing anybody? Yeah, so that's actually a perfect segue uh, for the political climate. So let's just talk about that a little bit. So you've been in this for a while. It's pretty bad right now, right? Like, could it get much oh. worse? I, I keep thinking that it's not gonna get much worse. And now I realize we're in an election year. We've got this crazy thing with Trump right now. That's 
<laughs> yeah, you just have to nod through this whole thing probably. But really, like, how much worse is this thing gonna get before this election comes? I think it's gonna get a lot worse. And I think um, because of how much it's being amped up on both sides, so whoever's in the White House next is gonna have a huge challenge. Like, if a Democrat is in there, all those people that have been revved up by the right and by Donald Trump, they're gonna be like, oh, I hate her! <laughs> like some people, you can't, you, if you just go Hillary Clinton, they go, ah, oh, I hate her. You can't even get her name out, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. You say Donald Trump, they go, oh, my God, I hate that guy. You can't even get their name out. So I think people are, have, are becoming amped up more than almost any election that I've seen, except for during the Obama election. It was pretty, it was pretty crazy. Right. With him and Sarah Palin, it was like. Wow. But in a weird way, doesn't it seem like, like, to me, it seems like we were all on ecstasy back then. Like, it was like seven you years. You always romanticize the past. Is it, that it? We just romanticized the past? Bad. It was bad. Yeah. I mean, come on. It was, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't American. He was a Muslim. He went to a madrasa. Um, what else? Oh, uh, you know, heirs. Socialist, all that socialist, stuff. Socialist, all those things. And then, you know, McCain couldn't find a running mate. And then he found Sarah Palin. And then that was a disaster. And then people said, oh, my God, everybody was out to get Sarah Palin. And then as it turns out, she was not as informed as she should have been. And so it was, you know, it was, it was, a, little, it was a little crazy. Right. All that said, we didn't have a Trump, right? How, how do you deal with this Trump thing? Because one of the things that I've noticed, and, and we've talked about a bunch. I, I, it makes me, I love interviewing him. Go you on. love it. I, I no, I don't necessarily love what he says. That's not. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, but the, the, the spectacle. I love. No, no, I love interviewing him because you don't know what he's going to say. I love the back and forth. I love the way his mind works. Doesn't mean I agree with him. And you know, when he's like, "Excuse me, excuse me, Don," you know, people at home are like, "Oh, he cut you off." It's inside, I'm kind of laughing. I'm like, "Oh my gosh," and I'm like, he, "You know," when he goes, "Ah, excuse me, Don," he it's it's a bit comical sometimes. He's, he's a performer. So I love interviewing him, but that's about it. So is that really, though, the secret sauce to what he's doing? That the rest of these guys, all of them, pretty much, I would argue that Bernie probably is not, because Bernie does seem like he's speaking from the heart and he speaks in a way that doesn't sound like a politician. But pretty much the rest of them, they all just sound like politicians and people are over that. Yeah. And, and because of that, even when Trump says crazy stuff, it makes people like him. Like there's, we're, we have this like, uh, thing that's like eating itself constantly with him. And because of that, I mean, I, I tell people this because I usually tick them off, right? I usually tell like people who are on the left that President Trump, get used to it. And they're <laughs> like, no way! But it's, you know, I have never, I have not underestimated him since he got into the race because here's why. And I said this from the beginning, you can probably find it on tape somewhere. He's used to swimming in these New York media waters, mm -hmm. sharks, right? He knows how to handle and manipulate the media. He knows how to cut a deal. You know, if you can, when they say, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. If this guy's made it I, with help from his dad, don't get me wrong. But, you know, he um, he's made it here. He's become, you know, at the top of the sort of food chain and the media food chain here. He knows how to deal with the media. And so, and he's got a lot of money. A lot of it of running for president is having a ton of dough. And he has a ton of dough and he knows how to deal with people. And he has a good ear on what people want to hear. So when he's in front of a crowd, he's like, oh, they like that, huh? And he gives them more. Oh, they don't like that so much. He changes the subject. So having known all of that and been, being here in the 90s and, and knowing Donald Trump, I was like, this guy isn't going anywhere. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, I got just a, a couple more for you because I know you have to actually- Are you blowing me off? You, no. <laughs> You have to be live on air uh, not too not too long from now. And about in two hours and fifteen. Oh, minutes. I got plenty. I'll go. Listen, I'll talk as long as you want to. Um, go ahead. So, uh, how much do you think? I, I, one of my major issues is when I watch something. Are like, we on live, by the way? Or no, no, we're not live. We're not. Okay. Live. Sorry. Um, when I watch something like the uh, you know the press club, the yearly thing where the media gets together and roasts the politicians and all that. What's it called? Not the press club. The uh, White House Correspondents Dinner. The White House Correspondents Dinner, thanks. Uh, when I watch all of this stuff, and even I saw you a couple weeks ago at the, in the spin room at the debate in Vegas. We were at the, yeah. the Democratic debate there. And I've been around it a little more lately. Um, one of the things that I really do fear is that 
the, the media and the politicians are just in it too tightly. That people are just too friendly with each other. They're actually, you know, they're, we have so many instances of people that are married to people on television and they're the kids of this one or the uncle of that one. On, on all of this stuff, uh, I'm pretty sure you, you're, you're, no one in your family is pulling strings in politics, right? Let's get that out of the way. Except for my cousin, Barack, but that's about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> of course he's your cousin, of course he's your cousin, right. Um, but really, how, do you see that as an actual threat to democracy? Because that I really see as a major problem. Uh, I don't know if I would call it a threat to democracy. I do see it as, um, it's a little fake and phony to me. Like, you know, it was great going to, you know, being invited to the White House Correspondence Center, but it was a lot more fun when I was covering it and I could make fun of people. Right. right. So how That's, much does that make you bite your tongue? Because you want to go to the dinners, right? Like, we've all it been does around. Not. It. <laughs> yes. it does not. Okay, so good. The first time I went to the White House Christmas party, right? And you know, because I knew the Obamas from Chicago. And it was, it's tough. And I, I've said this before like, when you know someone, uh, people, I didn't know them that well. They weren't my best friends, but I knew them from around the way, right? From being, I was a local news anchor and they were there, they, you know. Sure. And I would introduce them at, you know, chicken dinners, like, no, oh, State Senator Barack Obama, and, blah, 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 blah. and then his wife would always say, oh, Don, stay out of trouble. And I'm like, who, me, why? <laughs> so to have to uh, sort of criticize him on policy and, and things, it was, a, it was, at first it was uncomfortable. And I'm like, well, he's the president and the buck stops with him. So I've got to, you know, and he's black or whatever. I've got to do it. I'm a journalist. That was, I, I took an oath. And so when I saw him sort of in an, in an informal context and not like throwing questions at him or seeing him at the NABJ and like yelling across the room, like, how are you going to handle this? And having him yell back when I had to go and like shake their hand and take a picture with them, I was like, Oh, <laughs> what are they going to say to me? And so I walked up and, you know, and they were like, Hey, you know, you did the right thing by coming out. And I was like, thank you, right? And so they get it, they get it. But it was a little weird and I felt like, I don't know if I should be that close to, when in this sort of situation to be partying with the president or for that matter, partying with some of the people, you know, when you go to the Oscars and all those things. I don't know, I just feel like, I kind of feel like Wendy Williams, right? Who sits on her purple chair and she like talks smack about everybody. And then when they see her or when she sees him, she's like, oh, there's <laughs> I kind of feel like that a little bit, so. Yeah, yeah. but don't you, think, don't you think that more of you guys need that sense? Because I, I yeah. totally feel like everybody, you know, and, and it's not just, I don't mean just the, at the friendly level, but you know, we don't, we don't have to, I'm not trying to you know, name names or out people here, but there are plenty of anchors that literally used to work on campaigns for, for president. Oh yeah. Or, I mean, you can name some names. Right, look, it's a little uh, weird to me. Look, I mean, somebody like, uh, you know, there's, Stephanopoulos, uh, right? Stephanopoulos, yeah. there is Diane Sawyer, there's uh, George Will. I mean, even and George Will is a commentator. Uh, David Gergen, he's a commentator. Donald Brazil, commentator. That's different. But when you're a journalist, you know, there are plenty of journalists who have worked for campaigns. Yeah. But when you're a commentator, how, how different do you actually think that is? So somebody like Donna Brazil. Totally different, Dave. But, but, but don't you think they have a certain amount of allegiance for a campaign that they, that they worked on previously? That they yeah. can, you know. I think they do. That's why we hire them. Yeah, because they not because they have allegiance, because they have knowledge to that person. Or will we will say, Donna Brazil worked for the Al Gore campaign. You, everybody knows that, so she can offer insight. But also, we, have, we would, unless you're crazy, you know that her allegiance would be to you know um, to Al Gore. Yeah, uh, I I think it's totally different because when you're a commentator, you're hired to commentate, as they say, or to comment uh, and to give your opinion. As a journalist, you're not necessarily that's not your role. Yeah. But you're pretty much right. I would say you're right in between those two things. Um, I do. I on CNN, what I do is I do a more of a point of view. On, I am hired as to give commentary on the Tom Joyner morning show, radio show, which had to be approved by CNN. So I I feel free and different in that zone to give. But when I'm on CNN, I have to watch myself because that's not exactly what you know I do. But. Everyone has a certain lens and everyone has a certain background and they have a point of view. And I think that's okay as a human being as long as you let people know that. And but that's nothing new. You know, Murrow, Cronkite, all those guys gave commentary. Right. Well, I always do think yeah. that's funny when, you know, some of these people on TV will say, Well, I don't share any of my opinions. And it's like that's pretty much impossible, actually, yeah. even, even if for no other reason than your body language when you're talking to somebody, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, um, and yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I don't see anything wrong with it, especially if you declare it. That's why I had, you know, when, when people were saying, oh, Fox is to the right. Okay, fine. They let you know. MSNBC is to the left. Okay, fine. They let you know. And we are neither here. We, we want to be objective at CNN, but we don't want people to, to, in our objectivity to let people run all over reality and truth. No. Yeah. Um, so I should tell everybody that right before we started the recording here, uh, you said to me, what are we going to talk about? And I said to you that I knew with you I wasn't going to have to, you know, a lot of times I'll tell my guests, oh, we're going to touch on these kind of things. But I knew with you that you were going to be cool with that. So I hope that that alone, I want my audience to know that because I hope that alone will dispel some of this stuff about sort of how a lot of you guys have to operate or at least how you have to operate. Because the person that I know off the camera is the same guy that I know right this second. Yeah, yeah. I there you go. And I, I don't want to know the exact questions you're going to ask me. And most of that was just like, hey, what are we going to talk about? What's going on? It wasn't yeah, no, like, you didn't you didn't push me at all. Hey, don't do that or I'm going to get mad. Yeah. No, and we don't do that with our subjects either. Like someone we're going to go interview, we don't give them the questions. I mean, I, they'll say, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about you running for president. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Give me, yeah. Uh, give me like your worst moment with a candidate. Like what's like the worst thing that's ever, any real flub or did you ever really offend anybody or anything like that? No, I mean one of the um, one of the most contentious moments was with Rand Paul. I'm sure you remember that. And I started this whole thing called No Talking Points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I hate, I hate, I hate talking points, and I hate the way politicians answer questions. So ask me a question, just a simple question, and I'm going to be a politician. Uh, Don, is that your office that you're in right now? Well, when you talk about offices, <laughs> what my grandmother taught me was that. You don't really own anything. It's all shared, and it's all part of the the American people own everything, right? And then you're just like, okay, are you going to answer the damn question? Yeah. So the simple answer is yes, this is my office. Politicians have a hard time doing that. So Rand Paul had did that with me, and I was just like, I'm like, look, man, could you stop telling me what you did yesterday in Congress and what you did? How do you feel about this? Do you hear the question that I'm asking you? And so then he got really upset and we, it became really heated. And so it was an uncomfortable moment, but it was also a very freeing moment to me because I was like, you know what? You know what? It, I, I'm sick of this. And yeah. so I, I uh, set a marker there. And so everyone I had that came on had to answer the question and they do now. Now, I'm not going to badger people because sometimes they just won't. And I'll say, OK. And then I will say it is obvious that you don't want to answer the question. So we will move on. Yeah. Right. Because I don't want to waste the audience time. So that was probably. Um, an, an uncomfortable moment that I had with a candidate, but then I just interviewed him two hours, three hours ago. So it's all, it's all good. Yeah. Do you ever bite your tongue though, related to the fact that you want these guys to come on again? Uh, because even when I was in the spin room talking to, talking to their representatives, not even the candidates, I did feel a little bit of, you know, I had Huckabee's campaign. They're all going to come back on. They're, at the end of the day. Maybe different I, for you, but they all want to be on CNN. Fair I, enough. They all are going to come. But yes, I know where you're going with this. And the thing is, it's not, it's not, so let me share a little secret with you, all right? All right. This is just between us. This is just between us. Yeah. So if you had that concern in your head, and that's a very real concern, and, that, and that's real because you do want people to come back, right? So it's all in the way you ask the question. It's all in the tone. And if I say, Dave, why are you such a damn bleeding heart liberal? You'll go, what do you mean? So you can just go, well, you know, that's a very liberal perspective. Why? Why do you feel that way? Yeah. It's the same question, right, pretty much. It's all in the way you ask it. It's like asking a question with a smile on your face. It's all in the tone. And you can do it by complimenting. It's like, I know you pride yourself on your politics and your liberalism. So would you answer this question for me? It's the same thing. Yeah. Well, that's it's you all know, in the way you ask the question. That sort of brings it back to where we started, this sort of online versus mainstream media thing, because I'll see a lot of times, you know, the online guys who aren't interviewing these people who are just commentating on it. They'll be like, ah, Lemon didn't attack him for this or he didn't do this or that. And it's like, well, guess what? He's the one that actually has to stand there, do it, get another interview in the future, you know, figure out how to get truth from people that aren't going to give you much truth. Uh, so my point is, it's it's easier said than done. Here's the thing, yeah, it is. It's not, and it's not even that. It's easier for them to say it because their way is not necessarily the best way or the easiest way, because you want someone to continue to sit there in the interview to answer questions, right? Uh, and you you also want you don't want to antagonize them. And I'm also thinking about the viewer 
Because if I continue to antagonize them, the viewer gets no information, that person shuts down, and it's not good for any of us. Yeah. Right? So it's done. So rather than, what am I going to do? Stand up, go over to the chair that the subject is sitting in, and <laughs> wring their neck? It's not, it's not going to happen. So if you're, if you're sitting there, Dave Rubin, and you don't want to answer a question, what am I going to do? Inject you with, um, what do you call it? Uh, sodium pentothal. Sodium pentothal? Yeah to make you tell the truth, it's not going to happen. So you get as much as you can, and then you move on. Yeah. That's how it works. All right, I got one more for you. But first, have you ever touched Wolf Blitzer's beard? <laughs> I feel like I'd really- I, I did today, <laughs> but not, like, not in that way. It was, we gave each other a TV hug, and it was a little weird, like, oh, uh, yeah. I'm convinced there's something, there's something, like the whole secret to his magic. success is magic. the beard. It's magic. It's magic. And he will be on my show at 10 p.m., so you have to watch. Oh, nice. All right, cool. Uh, all right, well, then my, my last question for you is what's next? Because I've, I've seen this thing, not to talk about the rise that you didn't want to talk about before, but, but I've seen it. I, I, I've flat out seen it. So what's next, man? So I'm sure you've read. Um, what, so here's the thing. People always ask me, oh, what are you going to do next? What's your, do you know how long I fought to get where I am? <laughs> So I'm just going to love this for a while. Like, I really, I wake up every day. And usually, you know, sometimes the first time I wake up is because an alarm goes off and it's time for my editorial call. And the first thing that's on my mind every day is, well, what am I going to put on TV today? That is pretty freaking awesome. So I'm in a really great spot. I'm, I live every moment in gratitude. Uh, I am very happy. I'm content. I'm not complacent. So I'm going to enjoy this for the moment. And I would have to say that the next thing, if I could think about it, but best laid plans, right, is probably a show that, that is more Bill Maher or Chelsea Handler-ish or something like that where I can actually give a point of view and actually say, like, you said shit or whatever it is that you said. <laughs> right. Uh, and not have everybody going, oh, my gosh. You can't, I can't believe Don Lemon said that. Right. Well, they're so, probably going to do that either way, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, so that's probably, if I had to think of something, but who knows. I will probably do this if all goes as it's going now, knock on wood, you know, God allow, for the next 10 or 15 years. And that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, well, listen, I 100%, you know how thrilled I am for your success and our friendship. And uh, I look forward to our next adventure at Blondie's. You, you can down some wings. You, you put me to shame. I mean, it was sad. I had to cut back. I was there this weekend, past weekend. Yeah. And I only ate eight of my 10 wings. Oh, yeah. I've ordered like two, I've ordered double orders when we've been yeah, together. Yeah, you before. literally, you got a double order. You had, I think, 48 wings on a plate. In no, but let, me t let me tell you this. Let me tell you. Um, I used to be able to do that in my 20s and 30s and 40s. <laughs> and now I can't do it. Wait, did you hit the big 5-0? I thought nope, you were 49. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. Oh, no. When I do have, you turn 5-0? I, I'm a little behind you. How far? Uh, I'm 39. Oh, wow. You're, you're older than me. I'm 37. Wait a minute, something ain't right here. Anyway, you guys can catch Don weeknights on CNN and pretty much wherever and whenever breaking news happens. Don, thanks a lot, man. Thanks, good to see you, Dave. You too. Keep up the good work.